Hello, everybody. I want to thank Reverend Carter for allowing me to do this class. You know, when I started teaching here in Atlanta, and I started going around doing lectures, lectures on energy, divine love, unity, psychological abuse, and that's what this, this class is on tonight, is psychological abuse. I wasn't really expecting a big turnout tonight. Then I see two, three hundred people here in front of me that have went through psychological abuse. Rather it be in a relationship, rather it be with a friend, rather it be with a mother or father or a family member or whatever the situation is, rather it be at work. And we all sit here looking for healing, looking for guidance, looking for answers. Because it is a pandemic. We have a narcissistic pandemic going across this world that never gets talked about, that never gets any attention whatsoever when it comes to news, when it comes to talking about it publicly, when it comes to finding a solution for it. And there's a reason behind that. Understanding how to heal is one thing, but understanding where it comes from is another. And one of the things I want to talk about is, well, number one, where it comes from. And I had a psychologist I listened to on YouTube yesterday. Very bright woman, very smart woman. I agree with a lot, a lot of things that she said. But she also said that narcissism cannot make another person narcissistic. And I respect her opinion as a psychologist, even though she has a more heightened degree than I do. But I don't agree with her because I've seen narcissistic behavior change behavior. Rather than be on a job site, you see a boss act a certain way, you see the employees act a certain way towards the same employee or towards our all employees. You see it in the family. You see the mother act a certain way, then the father acts a certain way. Narcissism can make somebody a narcissist. I've seen it within myself. I saw it within myself. Back in 2020, 2021, when I came here to Atlanta to, to actually check out a relationship, and, and this person created a trauma bond with me. And this person was so abusive and so vile and so any which way that you can say bad. But it caused me to make a fake Facebook account. And spy on people like people were spying on me. And it's like, why am I doing that? I had to catch myself and eliminate that behavior. And I saw myself acting just like this person. I saw myself doing the same things that this person was doing. And I had to catch myself and eliminate that behavior. Understanding what the problem was, was the first stop, was the first pain of ending the behavior. Why does narcissism exist at such a high level today? Because when you hear the world, all we need is love. Where's the love? Why can't we love people? Why don't we have empathy for each other? Why can't we just understand each other? Why can't we communicate with each other? And it's because there is an imbalance in this world that never gets talked about. Because if you really look at the balance that existed back in the 60s. And then in the 70s, it started deteriorating a little bit. And then 80s, it started deteriorating a lot more. In the 90s, it was really starting to become imbalanced. And then when the 2000s came around, right around 9-11, the imbalance started taking hold. And there wasn't really much balance at all after, after 2000, 2001. It's like 2001 was the start of the, the big decline. Because if you really understood, understand the difference between a passive person and an empathic person, you would understand why there's such an imbalance. Because you have an empathic person, an empathic person's abilities is to heal. An empathic person's abilities is to actually hold things together emotionally. To have the emotional support, to have the emotional healing, to have the emotional psychological help, whatever the situation is. 
your pastors, your teachers, your leaders, your counselors, your psychologists. But most of all, the people that stand for others that are broken and heal them. Then you have your passive people that are your doctors, your lawyers, your technological people, your engineers. There's a need for those people also in this world. And then you have the psychopath. The psychopath is born a psychopath. Nobody is made into a psychopath. Either you're made into a sociopath or you become a narcissist or you get borderline personality disorder from a psychopath. But a psychopath is born a psychopath. The psychopath rate rose or started to rise in the 70s. And it was pretty much like 48% passiveness, 48% empathicness, 2% psychopath. And you could always spot a psychopath because psychopaths never got much attention because everybody kind of seen, seen their game and everybody kind of eliminated attention from them. But in the 70s, the psychopath rate grew and today, the psychopath rate is anywhere from 10 to 12 percent versus 2 percent like it was back in the 70s. Now, this is where everything gets messed up and why there's such an imbalance today that does not even get talked about or get mentioned. There was this balance between empathicness and passiveness. Now, you have passiveness... That's over 50% of the world. Then you have passive aggressiveness, which is about 15%. And understand passive aggressiveness could also mean borderline narcissist. That could also be borderline personality disorder. That could also be sociopath. Then you have your psychopath rate, which is about 10 12% which leads impasse down to the 1-2% nowadays. So now you don't have the spiritual healers like you used to. The emotional healers. They've been eliminated by, the face, by, by pretty much the psychopath that has eliminated them. That has made them go in isolation. That has made them not understand their calling. That has made them not understand how to use their abilities. Because everything has become passive. So then you have the passive people trying to give emotional support. Your doctors, your lawyers, your engineers, they're doing the same things that the counselors and the pastors and the spiritual healers and the emotional healers are doing, and it's not working. That's why there's an imbalance. And that's why it doesn't get talked about enough. And when there's an imbalance, it causes the psychopath and the narcissistic rate to go up. And if you look at statistics, Atlanta is one of the top five narcissistic cities in the country. And I, I, I actually come from Phoenix, Arizona, for those of you that you actually know me. And Phoenix, Arizona is not even in the top 50%. But yet I've seen it there. But I've not seen it there like I have here. Entitlement is narcissist. Is, is, is a narcissist is a uh, form of narcissism. We need to drop our entitlements and love everybody and respect everybody the same. And we have so much entitlement in Atlanta when it comes to people, but we but people feel like they're owed something. People feel like that something needs to be given to them. I had somebody tell me in a court session on Wednesday, well, I make $23 an hour. I should be making $100 an hour. If you're not even thankful for the $23 an hour, why should you make the $100 an hour? If you're not even thankful for what you have in front of you. The entitlements that we have is our ego at play. What we have 
who we are, what people think about us, is our ego. And if we allow our ego to take over and control us, we're edging God out. And if we're edging God out, because if we're, you know our ego is taking over, it's like, oh God, we don't need you. We're okay all by ourselves. We don't need love. We don't need support. We're just, we're the best in the world. We're number one all by ourselves. And I, I like to use this philosophy a lot. And a lot of people that know me have heard me say it probably about a hundred times. And I'll probably say it a hundred more times. The quote from Rumi. Drop water in the ocean. If God is our ocean, we are a drop of water in that ocean. But we feel like we're powerful as a drop of water out of the ocean by ourselves. And we don't need that ocean that is God. We don't need that ocean that is all of us together connected as one. But we think we're this powerful drop of water by ourselves. And in that ocean is abundance. In that ocean is love. In that ocean is connection. In that ocean is everything that we need to sustain life at all costs. But our ego tries to tell us, but we don't need that ocean, but we're just a powerful drop of water all by ourselves. That is an illusion. Just like it is an illusion that we are separated from each other. That we are not connected to each other. Because of the color of our skin. But we are different from each other. That is an illusion. It is an illusion that people want to say that it's wrong to be this way, it's wrong to be that way, it's wrong to be this way. When we just can't accept people for who they are and love each other. With God, with this ocean of abundance, with this ocean of love, there is no exclusiveness, there's only inclusiveness. Your fears, your entitlements, your anger, your hatred, it's all illusion. Your problems are all illusion. And we need to realize that everything that has a dark energy behind it, is all illusion. So the first step of realizing, of understanding how to heal from narcissistic abuse, psychological abuse, emotional abuse, is understanding. It's all an illusion. Mm -hmm. We cannot hate the person that did what they did to us. He, she, mother, father, brother, sister, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, boss. We gotta learn to let it go. We gotta stop blaming ourselves. Do and that, that used to be a problem for me with the person here in Atlanta, but I had a psychological abuse of a relationship with. And this person doesn't realize that he creates a narcissistic abuse of relationship. And every time I'm around this person, this person's trying to gaslight me, trying to make me believe how great he is, tries to make me believe how bad I am, how below him I am, and tries to gaslight me about myself. I chose not to accept it. I chose not to blame myself, but I also chose not to blame him because it is a pandemic going around the earth. It doesn't matter if you're from Africa. And somebody was asking me, well, isn't Africa probably the most narcissistic continent on the planet? I think all continents are the most narcissistic continent on the planet. Now, Africa does have narcissism because you have control. And wherever you have control, you have narcissism. You have governments that control their people. 
You have churches that control their people. And when you have governments that control their people, then you have churches that control their people. Then you have parents that control their kids. And their kids control everything else. That is a recipe for narcissism. How many people have HOAs? I see it in my HOA. They want to make rules, they want to make regulations, but they do not want to consider your feelings or thoughts. And it's kind of a, kind of a uh, silly situation because I just went through something like that. They want to replace the stairs on our HOA. And as a homeowner, I don't mind them replacing the stairs at the HOA. But you've got to give somebody a date, a notice... Either you've got to give them access to their property or you've got to give them a place to stay while, while the stairs are no longer there. And they didn't want to do none of the above. And people were getting pissed off because the narcissism was taking hold. This woman, her ego, and what she wanted was more important than the people. And it created conflict. And that's what you've got to understand. And of course, the steps never got done. The stairway never got completed. Nobody stayed in a hotel. Nobody had access to their house. It was just a big, long, dispute, argument, fight from every single homeowner in that building, including myself, that had to stand for his rights, for my rights. Why? Because you had one person that wanted to make up the rules and exclude everybody else except her idea. So now that we now understand that there is a narcissism pandemic that is taking, taking hold in this world, and you see it every single day. You get around friends, you get around a job, and the boss's attitude change, changes, everybody, else attitude, uh, everybody else's attitude changes as well. And I, I've sat there and see it my whole life. I sit there and see people change. And I refuse to do it. It's like, yesterday we had a certain attitude of working together as one. Now we have an attitude of working together as one person. And you, without oneness, things just do not work. We need that connection. We need that love. We need that fulfillment in our life. So how can you heal from narcissistic abuse, psychological abuse? We need to connection to people. The one thing that is going to help you heal from your mental abuse and your psychological abuse is connection to people. Like-minded people. People that have been through the same abuse that you went through. And there needs to be support groups. And I've had hundreds of people talk to me this last six months. Why don't they have support groups for mental abuse? And one of the things I want to do is I want to write this book, Don't Let Somebody Storm Become Your Darkness. And I'm actually in the process of starting that right now. And one of the things I want to find a way to do, especially here in Atlanta, which is one of the top five narcissistic cities in the country, is start emotional support classes, emotional abuse support classes. People need to sit there, need to sit down with each other, be one with each other, brainstorm their pain and overcome it together. If alcoholics can do it, if drug addicts can do it, if sexual addicts can do it, if gambling addicts can do it, emotional abuse addicts can do it. Because emotional abuse is also an addiction. And I had somebody from Alcoholics Anonymous back in Phoenix. Emotional abuse is not an addiction. You don't know what you're talking about. It is an addiction. Because the moment you allow somebody to come into your life, and let me tell you the stages. 
Because I kind of explain why the world is so upside down with the energy fluctuation. Because when you have somebody come into your life that is a narcissist, that is a psychopath, that is a sociopath, that is borderline personality disorder, whatever the situation is, they love bomb you. They give you this incredible stand your hair, stand your hairs on your arms type love that you've never had in your life. Such positive affirmation. And you love this positive affirmation and you become addicted to this love and positive affirmation that you've never received before because it is the most powerful love and affirmation you've ever received in your life. Then, that love and positive affirmation turns into abuse. They start to pick you apart. Oh, your teeth are messed up. Your hair, you're you're missing hair on on your head. You're you're 10 pounds heavier than what you need to be. You look like a Klingon when your face breaks out. Whatever the situation is, don't laugh too hard. Then it starts to become abuse. And then when they and then they try to come back into your life and love bomb you again, that is when they hook you. Because you're not addicted to the abuse, you're addicted to the love bomb. And those are the memories you remember. (coughs) You remember the positive affirmation, and that's what you want from this person. And then you start going out of your way, trying to fix things, trying to make things right. Well, what if I do this? Can I get this positive affirmation again? If I can please this person this way, if I can be good enough this way, if I can do this, you start trying to fight for the love bomb and positive affirmation that you receive, received from the beginning. And you get it in spurts. And then when you get it in spurts, you get it in a small moment, you're hooked. Then it goes back to the abuse. And all of a sudden now, not only are you addicted to the love bombing, but now you're addicted to the abuse. That is called a trauma bomb. And then the gaslighting takes effect when they try to make you believe things about yourself that are not true. Like if somebody, like if your spouse injures his or her hand and then they try to say that you did it, did that. I didn't injure my hand. You injured my hand. You cut me. And then they make you believe that that is the worst form of abuse that you could ever do to somebody is to make them believe something that they're not. And this person here in Atlanta tried to make me believe so many things about myself that were untrue. And the sad part about it is is he never knew who he did it. It was just habit to him. You become codependent on them not only for their opinion, not only for their love, but in some cases, mine especially, financially. They feel like they can get whatever they want out of you financially. And to him, like I said, it's a habit to them. They, they don't even realize they're doing it because they're in denial. It's such a habit. And once you're in the trauma bond, you'll go back to the abuse. And you're going back to the abuse wanting to be love bombed. Because you're looking for that positive affirmation that you had at the beginning of the of your relationship. And what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again. And what happens during a love bomb process? A trauma bomb process? You're going back being abused trying to receive the same love and affirmation you received during the love bombing process. And then sometimes they'll give it to you and you'll feel this absolute dopamine high. Because that's what it is. It's, it's like dopamine. It's like a drug. Because when they love bomb you, you feel this dopamine high that you've never felt in your life. It is the most positive affirmation, the most positive love affirmation you've ever felt in your life. 
Then they take it away with, within a blink of an eye, abuse you, and then they come and then they give it back again. When they want something. When they need something. And it becomes a cycle. Most of us break this cycle and say, there's not something, there's something not right here. Sometimes it takes years for most people to overcome relationships like this. I've known people that are um, older. There were relationships like this for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And now they're saying Alzheimer's can actually be caused by narcissistic psychological abuse. Because your brain goes in the brain fog. You can't think right. You can't think straight. And I remember being in court with this person last week and how my hands were shaken, how my whole, my whole body was shaken. It's not that I'm afraid of this person because I'm not afraid of this person. I don't take blame on myself for anything this person did. I am past that stage. Because you remember the trauma, I, I found myself not being able to speak in front of the judge. I found myself shaken. I, I found myself having that dark, eerie feeling around him. That is understanding that there's a trauma bond that, that was formed. That's like going back... That's like having an auto accident and you almost died in that auto accident and you go back to the site of that auto accident. You're going to absolutely be trembling because you remember that trauma. And there was a situation back in 2016 where two people broke into my house in, in Phoenix. I actually lived in Glendale, Arizona, a suburb outside of Phoenix. And as... I, I found my way out of the house. I, I, it, there was, a, there was, a, there was a, a lot of miracles that manifested itself. It, it made that situation come to fruition where I was actually able to get free. I escaped both of these guys trying to kill me. One of them tried to strain me. And I remember... They didn't get away with anything because there was a series of events where miracles happened where I was able to hide my keys and hide my wallet. And, and that's how God works. He, he works for manifesting miracles. And manifesting miracles are not miracles at all. It's all synchronicity for the universe. And if everything is synchronicity for the universe, maybe these people come into our lives to teach us something. They're our lesson. So we know how to love better. And maybe it's a test. I don't have the answer to that. None of us have the answer to that. But have we become better people? How many hands? Let, I want to see hands. How many of you become so much better person inside, realizing who you are, how to love better, and how to respect people, and how to be a better leader? Everything, all of us. Who's become a better person since they've left their... Um, psychological abusive relationship, every hand goes up in the room. So it is a test that you had these moments. So anyways, I actually escaped being killed from these people and I had to go, I had to go back into my own house. And for like a week, I couldn't go into my house without looking in the closets. Looking, in the, looking behind the shower curtain. And it's like, why am I doing this? I'm going into my own house and I'm looking in the closets and looking in the shower because there was trauma that happened there. And it's the same situation when you run, run into your narcissist, when you run into the person that psychologically abuses you. That person could do absolutely nothing to you. That person could send you a text telling you that they wish you in the grave and they think you're ugly, and you can go F yourself, or whatever the case is, and it's going to affect you. Because it's trauma connection. From a trauma bond that lasted for so long. And seeing this person in court was making me shake. It was making me nervous. 
Not because I was nervous, because it brought back the memories of trauma that happened between me and this person. So going back to healing, we need to, we need to be around like-minded people, positive energy people. People that we can connect to, family members that we can connect to, friends that we can connect to. We need to keep ourselves busy. Number one, be around like-minded, loving people. Number two, keep ourselves busy. Keep our minds off it. Yes, you're going to go for the pain. Yes, you're going to go for the darkness. Yes, you're going to go for the brain freeze. And you've got to allow yourself to go through that process. And my advice to you is do not sit around the house moping about it. You've got to go out. You're in Atlanta, go to Piedmont Park when you have free time. Or go to the Reynolds Reserve down in Morrow. Or go to the Atlanta Zoo. Do something with yourself where you can feel some positive affirmation within yourself and some positive energy. And that's what you've got to do. If it means going out to go do, going out to a karaoke bar on Saturday night instead of feeling alone, instead of feeling those moments, then that's what you've got to do. You've got to get yourself out. And that was one of the things that I really struggled with when I, was first, when, I, when I first went through this here in Atlanta because I didn't know anybody, number one. And number two, I was living with a friend and inside a bedroom and didn't, really didn't have my own place. So it was really hard for me to kind of get out. Number three, meditate. You gotta meditate. You gotta connect with God. You gotta let God know that you're there to have Him heal you. Often, every day. Number four, listen to people on YouTube. Or CDs, or whatever, wherever you can get the information, audio book that are going to help you heal. Wayne Dyer was one of the people that actually helped me heal. He still helps me heal. Tony Robbins. Doctors that talk, doctors that talk about narcissism can also help you, but you need some spiritual and depth, depthness when it comes to healing. And if when you're listening to a spiritual solution, a seven-hour audio from Wayne Dyer doing lectures is going to help you heal for a couple of days, and then all of a sudden you go right back into that moment, listen to it again. Because if something is taking you out of that mode, because, if there's some, because that's what he does. He teaches universal truth. He teaches universal truth It helps you look deep within yourself so you can eliminate that pain. And if you can't listen to that one, find another audio. Find somebody like Wayne Dyer that is spiritual minded that that can help you look deep, deep within yourself. Listen to TED interviews. Listen to people talk about what they overcame in their life. Surround yourself by inspiration. To be in spirit means inspiration. Inspiration means to be in spirit. Inspirato, which was a Latin term for inspiration. In spirit. Inspiration. You want to be inspired. The more inspiration and being inspired you are, the more you're going to heal from that situation. Number five, talk to other people that have overcome the same situation. Share thoughts with each other and share moments with each other. Talk about your stories with each other. Meet at a bar. Meet at a coffee shop. Meet at your house. And just talk it out amongst each other about your your relationships. That's going to help you heal as well. You're going to go for pain. You're going to go for anguish. You're going to go for darkness and you're going to go for hell. Especially when you first leave this person and you have no contact. The moment you have no contact with the person, 
You, you, I mean, that dopamine is going to kick in where you want to call that person and you want to give that person positive affirmation and you want to be around that person because you are addicted to this person and you're addicted to this person's abuse and you're addicted to this person's love bombing. And you're wanting the love bombing and that's what you're mostly addicted to, but you're going to get abuse. And when you know that you can't go back to this person... You are going to feel disconnected from the world because you gave yourself to this person 110%. You gave yourself to this person. You gave yourself to this person, whether it be whatever the situation is, you became codependent completely on this person because that's what narcissistic people, psychopaths, sociopaths do. They make you completely, completely codependent on them. And you really don't have anybody else in your life. You maybe have a couple friends, but you, you don't talk to them as much because you're constantly connected to this person. And you're at this person's beck and call on every single thing that they need, helping them out with their problems, but you seem to forget about your own because you're addicted to this person and this person's love and affirmation and this person's abuse. It's going to be hard. And I wish I could say there's an easier way to overcome this. And I think once we can find a way to get some mental abuse classes, because mental abuse is addiction too. If mental abuse was not addiction, we wouldn't have trauma bonds. So that's what we we need to understand, is we need to understand that we need to overcome All this, step by step by step by step. And of course, step number six, love ourselves. I need a Majani, a lady that actually survived cancer for the worst possible possible circumstances, having lemon-sized tumors. That's one of the things that she realized when she had a chance to come back and live is... Treasure your own magnificence. Love yourself. You've given so much of your time and energy to this other person, you've forgotten how to love yourself. 